bring our community matters here at noon on a given Monday. And today we're excited in Community Matters to be reporting on the March for Science, which is taking place this Saturday on the street all over, all over UH and all over other places too. And our guests for this segment, part two of this discussion on the March for Science, uh, to my left, uh, we have Mark Hickson. Where he is the Shao Endowed Professor of Marine Biology at the Department of Biology at UH Manoa. We have Priscilla Seaborn. She's, a, PhD, she's an, a, a Master of Science and a PhD student at the Department of Entomology. That's bugs. At <laughs> UH Manoa. And Dr. Grant Yamashita, he is an evolutionary biologist and consultant. And he has assured us that if we have any questions, he will consult with us about evolutionary yes, biology. I the will. problem is it takes 10,000 years. No, it does not. To, no, no, it okay. does not. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> okay. We'll hold you to that. Okay. <laughs> so you guys are all involved in planning and executing this march on April 22nd, this Saturday. Talk about it. What, what have you done? What do you expect? Well, this, um, this whole thing arose um, since the election. And um, there's been great concern in the scientific community that's been growing for decades. Mm -hmm. So this was sort of the, you know, the spark that lit the flame for people to start self-organizing. And a group of scientists and concerned citizens got together and said, what can we do? In Washington, D.C., they came up with the idea of a National March for Science. And from that sprang almost 500 other marches, including Honolulu and other islands, um, and something like 40 nations now. I think, wow. it's, I think it's over and, 50 now. Yeah. 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 Outside the U.S., yeah. this is a global statement about science. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's you know it's the motivation is several fold. One is just it's time to celebrate science. You know, yeah. there's been so many amazing yeah. discoveries being made and and you know, an actual natural cel national celebration for science would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. But then it's also in reaction to the growing denial and abuse of science that's been taking place, again, for decades, but now seeming to reach a crescendo. Abuse is an interesting word. People abuse the truth. They come up with alt science, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that's an abuse to all of human knowledge, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with this because I, your comment especially about how it's been growing for a while, it's not just the election of Donald Trump. No. It's been growing for a while. There's been this sort of, this, this separation of, of, you know, public thinking, public opinion, not only in this country but elsewhere, and science. Why has that happened, Mark? Why has that happened? Well, my understanding is that most people are just fine with science and respect science, respect scientists, until there's a finding that conflicts with their worldview or conflicts with the dogma that they've been taught. And then suddenly there's cognitive dissonance. And it's typically easier to deny the science or attack the scientists than it is to change one's worldview, because that's always a big change inside <laughs> it's one's like mind. like the bubble theory. Yeah. You live in yours, I live in mine, yeah. never the twain will meet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing about science is science, being relatively objective and dispassionate, will produce results that don't make anybody happy. You know, when we find that there's an environmental issue or that a chemical causes cancer or whatever it is, you know, we just have to report it. That's what the science says. And people are like, I don't want to hear that. Especially if they're somebody who's producing that toxin or yeah. that problem. Or who will be affected by it. Or and who, who would like to deny that they'll be affected by Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, reality. So Priscilla, you know, uh, can, you, can you tell us um, the website? By the way, there's a hint on this. <laughs> MarchForSciencehawaii.com. So can you tell us the website? Um, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like what the website is? Yeah. Or, um, well, yeah, there's a Facebook page, okay. there's different ways to access it. I'm actually on the Facebook page because as, you know, um, a younger, I guess, student, that's how I get, you know, most of we my... Like students. Yeah, we like social media. <laughs> and it's, I mean, social media, you know, it can be a really good resource for things like this. And that's actually how mm -hmm. I learned about the March for Science initially. And then I found out my... Um, 
uh, PI or principal investigator was also the organizer for it. So I thought that who, was who is cool. that? Uh, Dr. Helen Spafford. Okay, yeah. we saw her last hour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's on Facebook. They do have a website. So it, would that be uh, March for Science Hawaii dot com? Um, that's a good. Uh, do I get a medal or something? <laughs> I think that's, that's a great subject. I think that's it. March for yeah. Science yeah. Hawaii dot com. There it is. March <laughs> for Science <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> that's good to know. And what's on that website? Um, there's going to be information about the, um, the different events. Um, like I said, most of my information I got from Facebook, and so that one actually has you know, information about the event, what it's about, so the description, and you can also RSVP to the event. So it's a good way to kind of keep track of who else is going to be there. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I we, go ahead. No, I've, um, I've actually been working on the website, so I can oh, okay. tell you a little better what's okay. actually yeah. on it. Um, today, the uh, information packet about the website just went online, so you can download a 14-page information packet um, that, that will tell you everything from the, the route of the march, um, where all the parking is, all the transportation um, options that you have, who the speakers will be, what activities there will be, um, and a nice little coloring um, sheet at the end as well. So, nice. um, a coloring sheet? A coloring sheet. It isn't every website kids. needs a coloring sheet? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's available today, but we have um, information about our mission and principles, um, things that we want to go on post-March. Um, we call, we're calling it after the March. Um, and just information about the, the, the activities, who all our endorsers and sponsors are. Um, just to keep everybody you know, up to date about what, what's going on. You have a ton of endorsers and sponsors. I've seen the list. Yes. And we don't have enough time on this show to go through it. <laughs> no. But it's, it's just suffice to say there are an awful lot of people, organizations in this community that are supporting this march. Yeah. It's a, well popular. Yeah. So <clears throat> one thing we didn't get a chance to cover in the previous part one, this is part two, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, last hour, yeah is the neighbor islands. There are marches, uh, sy sympathetic marches on the neighbor islands. Can you talk about it? Yes, so um, right now there's officially, there's a march in Kahului on Maui. There's one in Lihue in Kauai, and there's one in Hilo. Uh, the Hilo one is especially interesting because um, originally they were going to march on Saturday like everyone else. But the Merry Monarch Festival is also <laughs> there that weekend. Priorities. Right. So instead, um, they decided to move it to Friday uh -huh. evening, uh -huh. the 21st. And so we think that they'll actually be the first march around the world, uh, the first March for Science uh -huh. march around the world. Um, and then they'll also be marching in the Merry Monarch Festival the next day. And since our march will be in the evening on the 22nd, we think we'll have the last march around the world. Oh, so perfect. Hawaii will <laughs> potentially be the first and last marches uh, this, well, this coming weekend. I hope we get national coverage. I think we will get national yeah. coverage. Yeah. But you said something about the world earlier, Mark, and mm. this is very provocative, you know, that, that the world has this separation you spoke of. That's not just Hawaii. Which I, I don't think Hawaii is very separate from science. I think we are very respectful of science and yes. understand it better than other places. Not, not just the U.S., but the world is having this separation. And this, therefore, this march is, as you say, Grant, it's a global march. Yeah. It's in how many countries? I think over 50 now. 50 yeah. countries. But, but what, what is happening here? This is fairly remarkable. We've had science since, um, since the days of the caves. Yeah. You know, the symbols on the walls of the caves were early science. Those guys figured out what they needed to figure out to survive. And that was, in its own way, science. Somebody once said that domesticating a dog, a wolf, to be a dog, that was science. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it was a tool. Yeah. Absolutely. To do things that people couldn't do. But, you know, where have people shoved off on this? Why is this a global issue? Well, I want to add also that the native Hawaiians were amazing scientists. You know, their knowledge of astronomy and natural ecosystems was just absolutely unprecedented for almost any culture. So science has been with us since we've been humans. There's no question about it. There just seems to be this growing disconnect between what science is telling us and what people want to believe in their hearts. You know, you can think back all the way to Galileo when suddenly the earth was no longer the center of the universe and he had a run-in with the church over that. 
you know, but it, it's that kind of thing, but it just keeps growing. But in the time of Galileo, I think yeah. people were, were amazed, right, with Galileo. Uh, da Vinci, they were amazed that he came up with this stuff. They were very respectful. Somewhere in recent years, it's changed. Is that the media? Um, is it science itself? Has science failed to do the job it should have done in terms of socializing its work to the public? Scientists, on average, are not very good at communicating what they do to except the public. Here, except here, except now. right yeah. here, right now, of course, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, that's always been a historical thing. Scientists tend to like just be focused on their science, and that's yeah. all they want to do. Yeah. Um, but more and more scientists are stepping up to communicate science efficiently to the public. But in my experience, having done this for decades now, it doesn't matter how articulate I am or how accurate the science is, there are people where they just won't let it come in. A wall goes up because they seem to believe that their worldview is being violated, or they've got a false dichotomy in their mind. Very typically, you can have a healthy environment or you can have a healthy economy, but you can't have both. And so if anyone starts talking about environmental issues, it's like, forget it. Yeah. I've got to, get, I've got to feed my when family. When I went to school, which was in the, well, I hate to tell you what, what decade of school, <laughs> say the 50s and 60s, okay? We um, overlap. Everybody, yeah, okay. He has more hair anyway. <laughs> everybody loved science. Everybody, mm -hmm. even the people in the social sciences loved science, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was going to make our lives better. It was very clear. And so, somewhere along the line, things change. And, and I, I'm interested in your comments, especially the millennials among us, if you will. Yeah, yeah. What, what happened to education here? I feel like, for me, um, when I first started with my master's degree, um, part of the learning experience was being able to even just read scientific papers. Um, you know, they're kind of littered with scientific jargon. And, you know, it took me one time four hours to read a paper because I was on Google, like, trying to, you know, look up the words and what they even mean and just trying to put together and so I think in that sense you know we as scientists can make you know things a little bit more accessible so we put out a paper but also taking the step after that you know educating the public about it after um, you know finding different ways to you know find look at our findings and give this to the public because most people, I mean, unless you're in a scientific, you know, based program, you're probably not going to be looking at these papers. You're not going. You're going to be looking on Google. You're going to be looking on Facebook, um, where a majority of people, you know, get their information. Um, you know, not that that's a bad thing, but um, I think the problem is, you know, we have to find as scientists, we have to find a way to make things uh, more accessible for people. Um, so I'm actually part of. Um, an organization at uh, UH, it's called Student Immuniz Immunization Initiative, or SII, and part of our job is just to educate the general public about vaccines and, you know, give them information about... Because there have been a lot of misunderstandings yes, in the public yes, about and, vaccines. And it's not to say that, you know, to make anyone feel, you know, ashamed or even, you know, you know, feel bad about their beliefs, but I feel like a lot of it is misinformation. And so our job is to just very nicely educate the public, like this is the data, this is what the show, what they show, these are the safety concerns. And so we kind of felt as a student uh, body that, you know what, we need to take away that disconnect and make a connection to the public and help them to understand some of these papers and look at the scientific jargon and that way it's more accessible and so that's kind of something I've yeah. been a part of and that's been um, really good we've we've been very active as an organization. Are you succeeding? Yeah I think we are we have over the course of a year so I'm actually vice president of this uh, organization and we have done over 17 events in a year. What's and, it called the organization? Um, student Immunization Initiative and so this is a student run um, it's all grad students we also are recruiting undergrads to kind of join us and all of it is based off you know educating uh, young students high school students educating um, mothers you know uh, people of my generation we just want to get the science out there and a more accessible format so so, so this is uh, evolution everything goes back to evolution doesn't it? Mm -hmm. right. so, so this is the evolution of science and I think we are recognizing because we have to that the public has to be socialized on this or the scientific initiative will be stunted yeah. somehow I actually think people still love science it's in the same way that they did in the 50s and 60s um, I agree yeah, yeah I, I think most people 
love science the way that they did back then. I think, um, you know, you, if you ask them, do, do they love their computers or do they love lactose-free <laughs> milk? <laughs> you, know, you know, it's it's science. I think people understand that. I think it's the proliferation of different kinds of news on the internet now. I think that's been one of the issues that have um, ah, maybe... So you have, so you have school where the teachers teach you about the good things about science and then you have the internet and the internet maybe is undermining what you're learning in school, is that what you're saying? Maybe not undermining it, but I think we have so many different um, avenues of news coming at us yeah. that sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to know which one is correct. That's right. true, which one is credible, yeah. which one is yeah. uh, just one of those fake news right. articles. So I wouldn't you know. say everything <laughs> is undermining the true science, but we have so many different um, you know, opinions that it's sometimes hard for the, for even, you know, yeah. scientists to know, yeah. wait, which one was it yeah. again? Yeah. So. And sometimes you just have to yeah. sit back for a little and, and let it all settle. And that is yeah. exactly why we take a break at 14 minutes after the hour. Yeah. <laughs> so we take a short break now so it can settle a little bit. We come back and we'll ask right. you tougher questions yet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. And it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is, what hu which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of uh, you know, many people of nature, of many other influences. So we're going to have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome um, manifestation of uh, humane architecture in the background. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Hey, Community Matters back. We're live. The March for Science is on April 22nd, this Saturday, at UH Manoa and elsewhere. And the one in, what was it, uh, the Hilo. Big Island, yeah. Hilo, is going to be the, the day before, the, day before, the night yes. before. Yeah. Uh, so, and we have three guests here. We have uh, Mark Hickson. He's the Shao Endowed Professor of Marine Biology, Department of Biology, UH Manoa. Priscilla Seaborn, she's a Master of Science and a PhD student at the Department of Entomology at UH Manoa. And she's involved in this uh, initi initiative for yeah, uh, uh, vaccinations, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Grant Yamashita, evolutionary biologist and also consultant, and he promised to consult with us today. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's, you, you wanted to add something, Mark, to what we were talking about just before the break. Yeah, this question about you know what's happened recently where suddenly this disconnect has occurred between science and society in some ways, and you know, for the average citizen, I think it's what I said before, that sometimes scientific findings come up against one's worldview and it's difficult to accept those, that shift. The other big factor here, no question, is when scientific findings conflict with what a corporation wants. So you can imagine, well, I mean, an old one that happened a long time ago was cigarettes and cancer. Oh, there you go. You know, so that was way before the present political situation. But the tobacco companies poured thousands and millions of dollars mm -hmm. into saying, no, there's no problem with smoking tobacco and cancer. And it, and it just took forever, it seemed, to finally break through that and bring about the change. Yeah. But they were you know, degrading science and scientists and purchasing their own sciences, scientists. Um, and that sort of thing continues. Here's one brand new example. It hasn't even really hit the headlines much yet, but it was recently found that the active ingredients in sunscreen, oxybenzone, is, has very negative effects on corals. I bet the sunscreen companies aren't very happy about that finding, but it's a fact, it's a truth. We must change our sunscreens, and it's not going to be difficult to do so. Same thing happened with the ozone layer back in the 1980s. Fortunately, changing those refrigerant chemicals wasn't that difficult, so there wasn't a big outcry. Now you come to climate change. 
major, major sea change must take place in our energy sources. And the powers that be in the fossil fuel industry don't want that. So it's well documented that they've put millions of dollars into denying the science, delaying action, and this is one of the big issues we face, no question. Yeah, and that's why I think this, this uh, march, uh, the March for Science, and the whole event that you guys are involved in, it came out of Trump. That's the reality. But it's also a statement of more. It's a statement of you guys have got to get used to science. You've got to accept science. You know, all these uh, conferences, conventions are credible. Uh, the, what they're publishing is credible. And you can tell how credible it is. Do not oppose that. Do not let special interest groups lie to you, um, as they have been doing. Let's respect what we know. And, and I think, um, so there's another message there, isn't there? It's not just that the government should, you know, stop with this uh, denying climate change. Mm -hmm. It's that the government has to respect science. We all, we all, we all have to know the issue and respect the science. That's Thank true. you for that point. Thank yeah. you. So um, let's, let's talk about your individual uh, disciplines. Let's start with you, Grant. You're yeah. an evolutionary biologist. Yes. I, I mean, I, uh, it's a fabulous area. It's, yeah. it's so provocative and, and so it strikes the imagination. Right. How can you live with yourself? <laughs> Um, it's, sometimes it's hard, um, um, ask my wife, she'll, she'll tell you, no. Um, so I'm, I, so I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, but my, my interests have always been in the history and philosophy of science. What is the relationship to the discipline of evolution, to, you know, um, the history of science, philosophy of science? So I think what, what Mark was just talking about is something interesting about what historians of science can actually do, right? Um, Naomi Oreskes, right? Her, you know, um, historian of science at Harvard, her book, The Merchants of Doubt, you know, it was all about the tobacco industry, all about climate change, and um, all the, all the uh, corporate work that went into denying um, connections between the science and uh, what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. um, I look at somebody that I work with closely, Dr. Jean Meinshine at Arizona State, you know, she, um, her, her work is on the history of embryology. So thinking about, you know, um, thinking about looking at the history of em embryology, the evolution of, of embryos from, um, you know, millions and millions of years ago, what can that tell us about um, embryos as they pertain to, um, you know, abortion rights and, um, and uh, women's rights and stuff like that. So. Uh, I think history of science and philosophy of science can actually tell us a ton about policies, you know, that we had we hadn't really really thought about because there's a way of connecting science to the past that I think is important for current problems and, and future problems as well. Yeah, and you can yeah. you track human development by science. Yes, human advances are most uh, accurately reflected in advances in science, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, I think so. Know, we can have wars, so. but yeah. that's not much of an advance. Yeah. No. <laughs> What about you, Priscilla? What, you know, what, what's your, uh, of course, the vaccinations are important. Yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of people out there who deny the value of vaccinations. Yeah. A lot of people out there who deny the risk of, of pandemic. Yeah. And yet we live in a world of potential pandemic every day. Yeah, very true, very true. So my history, um, so I got my master's degree at Department of Tropical Medicine at JABSM. And so there I learned about different things like infectious disease. Um, we were introduced about you know, different vaccines and how to prevent certain pandemics, things like that. And and we also got introduced into, yeah, like there are people that um, do not want vaccinations, unfortunately, and do kind of deny the science, unfortunately, and they think um, there's an issue with safety, um, things like that. And so my that was kind of my history is just looking at infectious disease. And now that I'm at you know, entomology, Department of Entomology. So I'm focusing more now on the vectors of disease, so mosquitoes particularly. And, you know, one of the things that's been on nationwide news is, you know, things like Zika. And really, what just last year, we had a dengue outbreak on Big Island. So it's important to study um, one infected disease, but also the vectors. Um, and so that's kind of my background. But um, 
you know, I do, I do feel very passionate about vaccines and just, you know, informing people and just giving them the right information so they can make these decisions for their families. So. It's, a, it's a really interesting question because the world is a much smaller place. I mean, we, we could have Ebola uh, everywhere if we don't watch out. Well, and, and the globalization, likewise Zika. yeah, the globalization of, the, of humans really has allowed for, I mean, Hawaii actually has no native mosquitoes. We are not an island that, um, Hawaii is not somewhere that, you know, all of the mosquitoes that are currently present have been through invasive, um, invasive uh, occurrences. And so, you know, that happened via globalization, you know, the fact that we have planes. So, yeah, you're right. It's very easy to have um, a pandemic. More now than it was, say, even 10 years ago. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Everybody flying hither and yon. Everything is connected, yeah. even places that weren't connected before. Exactly. And these, these uh, vectors can be established uh, virtually overnight. I yeah. saw a piece recently about Ebola. And there were a lot of people in Africa who yeah. didn't think that the, uh, you know, the, that the treatment was necessary, uh, and they would break through the, the quarantine. Um, and of course, uh, that, that had to be stopped. And, yeah. and so I, I, you know, I, I offer you this thought. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have an intersection of disease prevention, you know, mm -hmm. what you do, and the law. Yeah. Sometimes you must say, no, you, you can't cross that line. Yeah, you yeah. must have your child vaccinated. Yeah. No, you must take the medicine. Yeah. No, you must cooperate with us in, in saving this particular community or society yeah. from a given disease. Yeah, especially we, we when haven't the really given got disease, there yet, though, yeah, you know? Yeah, well, especially yeah. when the given disease can be very, um, you know, detrimental to, you know, majority of the population. Is That's, I think, something where that comes into issue. And But hopefully, you know, if we can just continue educating people, it won't have to be something that, you know, is mandated, but people just say, yeah, I, you know, want to get vaccinated because, you know, you know, the scientific data has shown that it's important and it's safe and it does prevent, you know, outbreaks like things like measles, you know. So I feel like we, as I said earlier, as scientists, we have to educate people and we have to just kind of keep doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. so. I would I would make laws that would have sanctions, though, <laughs> because some people are yeah. uneducable. No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. There, yeah, there are people that are unapproachable when yeah. it comes to this, and they have their, like you said, we have world people that have world views, and it's very hard to um, educate them and also just persuade them that, you know, hey, there is an issue with your worldview, and it doesn't kind of, you know, <laughs> balance out with science, but that's a hard, that's a hard subject yeah, to tackle, because yeah, I've, I've actually had, you know, communications with um, anti-vaxxers, and, you know, for the most part, um, there's, I've had a friend that, you know, we did educate her, and she was able to understand, and, you know, I approached it from a very nice point of view, and just said, you know, what are your questions, what are some concerns you have, and let me show you the information, you know, I didn't attack her, but, um, but I've also had interactions where it was like talking to a wall, and I kind of, you yeah. know, just had to stop, yeah. so. Happens. So I, yeah. I leave you with the most difficult question of all. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> this, is, this is not an option. Science is not an option. We have nearly 10 billion people, did I get that number right, mm -hmm. on, the, on the planet today? Maybe Over seven. Seven, okay, we're climbing. We're climbing. Okay, and um, you know, they're all at risk. Our, our society is at risk, our infrastructure is at risk. All the delicate systems by which we live are at risk. And if we don't listen to science, billions of us are going to die. I'd like you to comment. The risk of ignoring science is incalculable. It's immense, it's incredibly immense. The issues we're facing now with the number of people on this planet are so extreme and starting to accelerate so rapidly that if science is ignored and delay is met, it is going to cost our children and grandchildren dearly. And that's why I'm marching for science. I have two grandchildren and it's all about them and it's heartbreaking for me to see what's going on now at their ages of four months and four years. So um, yeah, I agree with you. At the same time, it's, it's, it's very important not to paint a picture of gloom and doom. We can change things on a dime if we choose to. I mean, it's very similar to when the U.S. decided to go to the moon. Yeah. Turned on a dime, amazing technological and scientific achievements, national pride, and just such cool science. Mm -hmm. So we, we can do this. And it's just a matter of the people demanding it. The people must demand it. The powers that be, the corporations, are not going to go quietly into the night 
although some of the more imaginative and creative and ethical ones are saying, wow, we need to change. Okay, we'll change in some direction. It needs to become a movement. What Joanna Macy calls the great turning. We must have the great turning. Well, the great turning is uh, <laughs> implicit in the, in the March for Science on Saturday, April 22nd at UH and elsewhere in the state. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for you guys for setting it up, for being there, for coming down today and talking about it. Mark, Priscilla, Grant, thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having us. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>